And today what we're going to talk about is uh, statistical tools uh, for engineers and particularly topics that are, are generally taught in engineering statistics courses. So we'll see how to summarize and graph data in jump. We'll talk about how to construct statistical intervals and perform hypothesis tests using the distribution platform and fit y by x under the analyze menu. We'll see how to build a variety of different types of models, in particular linear models using the fit model platform, nonlinear models, and I'll briefly introduce tools for survival and reliability analysis. We'll see how to design and analyze experiments in JUMP, and we'll introduce some common tools for industrial statistics, including statistical process control, or SPC, how to perform process capability studies, how to perform a measurement systems analysis or study, and some other quality tools. The topics that I'm going to cover today, I'll open up this bottom outline. In fact, I'm using a journal during this webcast. There are a variety of resources for learning JUMP, and I'll point out jump.com slash teach provides direct access to a variety of these resources, including a learning library which has short videos and one-page guides on most of the topics that I'm going to introduce today. There's a nice case study library, and there are a variety of other webinars that are available. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And I'll be using data from the sample data directory throughout this webinar. And these data sets can all be found from the Help menu under Sample Data. This data set is uh, the diameters data. And what we're looking at is diameter for the, the response variable, or the variable of interest. And this is for a process that involves multiple operators, multiple machines. And phase indicates a before and after period, so before and after a change was made to the process. To summarize data, there are a number of nice tools available. And we can produce summary statistics and graphical summaries of our data. So we'll start with, under the columns menu, a nice tool for getting a first view of your data in terms of summary statistics is the columns viewer. The columns viewer allows you to select a number of variables. And if I'd like to see quartiles or percentiles, I'll check this box. And I'll select Show Summary. So this gives me a high level view of my data. And as I click through the variables, Jump is selecting those variables in the background. For categorical variables, and if you're relatively new to Jump, the icon next to the variable name indicates the modeling type of the variable. So where you see red bars, this indicates that we have categorical data or nominal data. The blue triangle indicates continuous data, where calculating an average might make sense. And the green bars indicate ordinal data or ordered categories. So where we have categorical data, we see the number of categories. So this data set involves 40 days, four operators, three machines, and two phases. And for continuous data, we see summary statistics. So a nice first view of your data. Uh, and it's also very useful for identifying potential data quality issues or issues with the way your variables are coded. Now from here, I can select all of these variables and select the distribution option. And distribution is used for both analysis and for summarizing data. And the same platform can be accessed from the Analyze menu. So Analyze options provide graphical summaries of your data and are also used for summarizing data in terms of producing summary statistics or producing tolerance intervals or confidence intervals or for performing hypothesis tests or building models. And most of the time in Jump, we're under the Analyze menu. For pure graphics, we use options under the Graph menu. So distribution is the first option. And this is used for producing univariate graphs or statistics. I'll select all of the variables and then click OK. If you're dealing with a very large data set, the red triangle next to the columns allows you to specify the types of variables you'd like to look at. And if you're only interested in looking at histograms, you can check the box at the bottom. Now the default view will look like this. 
So we try to take advantage of the space that we have on our desktop by producing vertical histograms and bar charts. Under the red triangle, you'll see additional options. And generally, the top red triangle relates to the window as a whole. And the triangles for each individual analysis relate only to that analysis. So if you prefer a horizontal view, the stack option can be used. The little gray triangles are used to tuck parts of your analysis away. So for example, I'm not really interested in looking at day-to-day -day differences. For continuous variables, we see a histogram and a box plot and some summary statistics. For categorical variables, we see bar chart and frequency distribution. And keep in mind when you're working in jump that the options under the red triangle update based on the type of variable you've selected and the platform you've selected. So for continuous response, we can do a one sample t-test. We can explore the shape of the distribution by asking for a normal quantile plot. We can fit any number of distributions. In fact, I'll go ahead and select normal here and jump overlays a normal distribution. And at the bottom, we see additional options for that distribution. So for example, if we'd like to assess the fit of that distribution, we can do a goodness of fit test or produce a diagnostic plot, which is in this case, a normal probability plot. All of these graphs are linked together. So if I click in a bar on one graph, it highlights the corresponding observations in every other graph. So this is the distribution platform. To produce tabular summaries of our data, under the Analyze menu is Tabulate. Tabulate has two drop zones. And as we drag and drop, so for example, I'm interested in looking at diameter, notice there's a blue box that's drawn around the drop zone. And this indicates that if we let go, the jump will do something with that information. So I'm going to drop diameter under the drop zone for columns. And by default, it produces the sum of all of the values in that column. The middle panel includes statistics that might be of interest. And if I drag and drop on top of the word sum, jump will replace the sum with these statistics. So here we see the overall mean and standard deviation for all of the data in this data set. The second drop zone is now a small box. So for example, I might choose to break this data down by operator to look for possible operator to operator differences. I can add further variables either at the bottom or I can build a hierarchical structure for the summaries by dropping variables on either side of operator. In tabulate to accept the summary that I produced, we call this panel a control panel I'll click Done to close the control panel. And again, under the red triangle are additional options. So if I'd like to make additional changes, I'll select Show Control Panel. If I'd like to save my work from any platform and jump under the red triangle, we can save the keystrokes that generated this output by using Script and the option Save Script to Data Table. This writes the code, and our language is Jump Scripting Language, or JSL and it writes it out to the data table. And as long as I save this data table, I can come back to this and select Run Script to regenerate that analysis exactly as I had saved it. You can also easily save your work to Word or PowerPoint or in another format. The FAT plus sign is a selection tool. We can select our output and use Edit, Copy, or Save As to save our work. So tabulate is for producing tabular summaries. For graphical summaries, we've already seen the distribution platform for looking at univariate graphs. For graphs involving more than one variable at a time, we can use the fit y by x platform or under the graph menu, the graph builder. And the graph builder is extremely interactive and can be used to plot a number of variables at a time. For example, I'm interested in looking at diameter. I'll drag diameter to the Y zone. And notice as I drag a var the variable over the palette, the blue zones indicate 
release zones or drop zones. So I can let go and in any one of these zones jump will produce a graph that makes sense for wherever I've released it. So I'll put diameter as the y variable and I'd like to again look at operator differences. I'll drag operator to the x zone. By default we see a scatter plot and across the top we see graph types that make sense for this combination of variables. Some of these are grayed out. So the line of fit doesn't make sense here. Asking for contour or density ellipse doesn't make sense here. But I might want to show a bar chart or box plot or histogram. If you have a graph showing and you'd like to add additional graph elements, you can click on a graph element and drag. So in this case, I'm adding the points back onto the graph. For any graph element you're displaying, on the side you see additional options for that graph element. There are additional drop zones available. For example, I might want to color these points by variable. I'll color them by operator. So I'll drag operator to the color zone. And anywhere in jump where you've asked for options, you can right click and see additional options. So here I'm looking at the, the relationship between operator and diameter. I might want to break this down by machine. I'll drag machine to the, the group X zone, the wrap zone, and notice that the graph automatically updates. Now two tools for interacting with any graph, I'll select done here, are the local data filter and the column switcher. And I'm using jump on a Mac. These same options are available on a Windows machine. And these can also be found in the red, tr red triangle in any window under script, local data filter, or column switcher. These two options are particularly useful to explore other variables. So for example, the local data filter allows me to select another variable. In this case, I'll select phase and update the graph or the analysis based on values of that variable. So I'll select 1 and then 2 and notice that the graph updates. So this is filtering the data that's being plotted based on the values that I select. Now this is a local data filter so it's only interfacing with the graph or analysis that it was launched from. There's a global data filter under the rows menu that interacts with the data table and all open graphs and analyses. The second option, I'll remove this, for interacting with, with graphs and analyses, particularly if you've got a lot of variables, is the column switcher. The column switcher allows you to swap out variables for other variables. So for example, I might choose to swap out operator with phase. So I'll select both of these variables and now as I click through it's automatically updating the graph based on the variable that's selected. So this is a quick view or review of summarizing and graphing data in jump. And Again we saw the columns viewer for summarizing one variable at a time, distribution for producing univariate graphs and statistics, tabulate for producing tabular summaries, graph builder which is the graphical version of tabulate, and then two tools for interacting with any graph or analysis. So let's move into analysis. Statistical intervals and hypothesis tests are performed from a number of platforms. If you're dealing with one variable at a time, we use the distribution platform. If we're dealing with two variables, we use fit y by x. And in general, for more than two variables, we use the fit model platform. And these are all options under the analyze menu. So I'll open a new data set here. This is called cleansing. And again, these data sets are all found under the sample data directory. This is from a book by uh, Myers. And what we're looking at is three different polymers. And we're looking at uh, cleaning of coal particles at different pHs. So the response of interest is coal particles. And then we've got a covariate. And then we've got a factor. So let's start by looking at this one variable at a time. Again, I'll go back to Analyze, Distribution, 
And I'll select all three variables. And I'm viewing horizontal view. Uh, if you're new to jump, under the jump menu or file menu on Windows is preferences. And preferences can be used to customize the look and feel of jump. In this case, I've asked for a horizontal layout in my distribution platform output. So I'm looking at coal particles. And by default, we see some statistics. We see an interval. In fact, we see a confidence interval for the mean. And anytime you're looking at statistics in jump, if you're not quite sure what you're looking at, there are a couple of forms of help directly available. If you take your mouse and hover on top of the statistic of interest, in fact, on a Mac, if you simply hold your mouse there, you'll see the definition of the statistic that you're looking at and you'll also see help in interpreting that statistic. So we call this hover help. Simply take your mouse, hover on top of the statistic of interest, and the hover help will appear. A second form of help is the question mark. So if you click on the question mark, and if you're on a Windows machine and don't see this menu appear, simply click the Alt key, click on the question mark, and place that question mark wherever you might have questions. I'm going to put it right here on this box plot. Jump will launch the interactive help, and it does a pretty nice job taking you to the topics that answer the questions that you have. So let's look at hypothesis testing in intervals. We see that we've got a confidence interval. Under the red triangle, we see additional options so we can change the confidence level for that interval. We can also ask for two different types of intervals. The prediction interval. A prediction interval is used to construct an interval that will contain uh, a future sample with some probability. I'll click OK. And the way we interpret this is we're getting an interval for, for both the individual value and for the mean. And since we've only selected one observation, then we're not getting an interval for the standard deviation. But generally, you're specifying a certain number of observations. And you want an interval that will contain that number of observations with some probability. The second interval is a tolerance interval. And a tolerance interval has both a proportion that we want the interval to cover and a confidence level. I'll go ahead and click OK here. And the way we interpret the tolerance interval is that in this case I'm 95% certain that 90% of future observations will fall within this interval. So you're making an estimate of where future observations are going to fall. So three types of intervals uh, from this platform, the confidence interval, prediction interval, and tolerance interval. To perform hypothesis tests, notice that jump doesn't directly provide the name of the test, but if you hold your mouse on top of options, you'll see what will happen if we select that option. So test mean allows you to perform a one sample t test or a one sample z test. It can also be used to perform a non-parametric test. And in Jump, you'll see that the non-parametric tests are available from the same platforms as the parametric counterparts. So let's perform a one-sample t-test here. We're going to specify the, the hypothesized value for the mean. And I'm going to put in something on the outer bounds of this 95% confidence interval. So I'll, I'll put in 337. Now if I knew the true standard deviation, I can perform a z-test. And again, I can also perform the non-parametric test here. And let me tuck some of these away. So I've just done a one-sample t-test. And if you're relatively new to hypothesis testing, Jump is providing the hypothesized value. And then we've observed a sample mean from a sample of size 18. We have a test statistic. And anywhere in Jump where you're doing a hypothesis test, Jump reports p-values as the prob greater than something. And that something is referencing the critical value from a distribution. In this case, it's the student's t distribution. So prob greater than the absolute value of t is the p-value corresponding to the two-tailed test. 
the number next to this is the p-value. And you see that there's an asterisk, and we see that this value is less than 0 0.05. The curve is trying to provide a graphical interpretation of what this test is doing. So the curve is centered at the hypothesized value, and what we're looking at is the distribution of all sample means of this size that we might observe under the null hypothesis. The red line is drawn at the observed sample mean. And what the test is doing is measuring how far apart the observed sample mean is from the hypothesized value. And the blue area in the tails is the p-value. If you're doing a one-tailed test, the prob greater corresponds to the alternative hypothesis that the mean is greater than our hypothesized value, and prob less than t corresponds to the p-value uh, for the hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis that the mean is less than 337. If you struggle a little bit with p-values, and p-values can be a little challenging to get your, your, your hands around or your head around, under the red triangle is a built-in animator, and it's called the p-value animation. And the p-value animation shows that it's essentially the same picture, but now we can interact with this picture. What the test is actually doing is measuring the distance between the hypothesized value and what we observed, which is drawn to this solid line. So we can explore what would happen if this distance increased, and notice how the t-ratio increases in absolute value, and we can see what happens to the p-value. So it's a nice way to think about what a p-value represents and what the test statistic represents. It's also a nice way to think about uh, power. So we can do a, an ad hoc exploration of power uh, using this animator. So for example, we only have 18 observations here. What if we had 100 observations? Or if we only had 5 observations? So again, this was available under the red triangle next to p-value animation. So this is looking at uh, statistical intervals and a hypothesis test for one variable at a time. What if we want to look at two variables at a time? So for example, we're interested in looking at the relationship between pH and the coal particles removed, or the different polymers and coal particles. In this case, we'll use analyze fit y by x. And this is a very flexible analysis and modeling platform, and the key in the corner provides an indication of the types of analyses that are available. And the analyses are guided by the types of variables you select. So if I select coal particles as my response, the legend on the side corresponds to the modeling type for your response variable. So I've selected a continuous response variable, and the two possible analysis types are bivariate, which is correlation and regression, or one way, which is two sample t test or ANOVA. If I select pH as my x or my factor, the legend across the bottom corresponds to the modeling type for our x variable or our predictor variable. And this combination will take us to bivariate. If I add a second variable, two different analyses will be performed. And in this case, we'll see one way ANOVA. And again, this will be two sample t test if we have two categories of the x variable, or ANOVA if we have three or more. In cases where we have a categorical response, the two options are logistic regression and contingency tables and cross tabs. I'll go ahead and click OK here. There are two different types of analyses that have been constructed bivariate fit. And when I click on the red triangle, we see the word fit a lot. Fit mean, fit line, fit polynomial. So this indicates that we're fitting a model of some sort. If I click on the red triangle for one way, we see a lot of options that contain the word means. In this situation, we're trying to make comparisons, and typically the comparisons are between the means. To fit a regression line, I'll select the option fit line. So this is simple linear regression. The fitted equation for the line is displayed along with summary statistics, a p-value for the whole model test, 
and then parameter estimates. All of the tables of output are live, so if I right click in the middle of parameter estimates and ask for columns, you'll see that there are additional options. So for example, if you're looking for the 95% confidence interval for the parameter estimate or the slope for pH, you can simply turn these two options on. For any model that we fit in bivariate, there's a new box below the graph, and this has additional options for that fit. If I click on the red triangle, for example, I can ask for residuals, I can save the formula out to the data table, I can change the alpha level or the confidence level. In this case, I'll go ahead and select plot residuals. And it's good practice to always look at your residuals first to make sure the model you fit makes sense. And here we can see a histogram and residuals. So this is a, a residual by predicted plot. And in this case, it looks like the points are simply rad randomly scattered around zero. And the normal quantile plot doesn't indicate any problems with normality. Additional options under the red triangle, uh, robust fit, so we do have robust methods in most platforms. Density ellipse, if you're looking for correlation, select density ellipse 0.95. And we represent correlation by using these ellipses. The tighter the ellipse is to a line, the stronger the linear association between the two variables. If the ellipse is a circle, then it indicates that the correlation is probably near zero. And I'll look towards the bottom of the page, and this is where the correlation value is reported. If you're interested in looking at correlations between multiple variables at once, under Analyze Multivariate Methods, Multivariate provides pairwise correlations uh, and non-parametric correlations. So this is bivariate fit. The second analysis is ANOVA. If I click on the red triangle, there are a lot of different options available. If I'm dealing with a relatively large data set, one option I typically will set is under display options, this option points jittered. And this will scatter the points out so if they have identical values or if you have a very large data set, the points aren't plotted one on top of the other. To perform ANOVA, I'll select means ANOVA. Anytime you see a diamond in jump, this is the way jump graphically represents a confidence interval for the mean. And this provides a graphical indication of potential differences between means. If two diamonds do not overlap in the tips, it's an indication that they're significantly different from one another. There's a tool on your toolbar across the top called the crosshair tool that can be used to explore this. In fact, I use this anytime I have two axes that I'd like to explore uh, the, the values for. Again, we see summary statistics provided down below, a whole model test for dif potential differences, and a summary of the means, and then additional options under the red triangle include analysis of means, compare means is multiple comparison procedures. If I'd like to isolate which means are significantly different from other means, I'll select one of these options. In fact, I'll select the first one. Each pair student's T allows me to do all possible two sample t-tests. If I scroll down, we'll see some summary statistics and test results. So it's comparing each mean to every other mean. And the comparison circles provide a graphical way of exploring potential differences. When I click on the circle corresponding to one mean, in this case, I've selected the circle corresponding to the mean of polymer C. Jump is doing a comparison between C and each other group. If another group stays red, then the mean I've selected is not significantly different from that mean. If it turns gray, it indicates that it is different. So in this case, I can conclude that the mean for C is different from the mean for A, but it's not significantly different from the mean from B. If you're doing several comparisons, you need to consider the experiment-wise error rate and all pairs TUKIS HSD, which stands for Honestly Significant Different, adjusts for the fact that you're doing multiple comparisons. Other options under the red triangle that we won't have an opportunity to discuss, several non-parametric methods, 
equivalence tests, again, robust methods, uh, normal quantile plots, uh, and several different display options. So this is looking at data two variables at a time. If we're interested in looking at variables more than two at a time, and we're interested in fitting a model, we'll generally use the FIT model platform. So let's talk about building models. If we're building linear models, we'll use FIT model. Nonlinear models, there's a nonlinear modeling platform under the Analyze menu. And we'll also briefly talk about survival and reliability. I'll open the same data, cleansing. And let's say I'm interested in, in making a prediction of the coal particles removed as a function of pH, the polymer, and the interaction between these two. I'll use Analyze, Fit Model. And by the way, I should mention that if you have paired data and are interested in doing a paired t-test, where the null hypothesis is that the difference is zero or some other value, then we would use matched pairs. So here I'll go to Fit Model. Pick Role Variables is where it's asking you what are the variables you want to use as your response and as your model effects or the terms in your model. Coal particles is Y, our response. pH is one effect. Polymer is a second effect. And there can be a third term in this model, which is the interaction between these two. To add an interaction, we select the two terms on the side and select cross. Now a shortcut for adding these, uh, which is particularly useful if you have a lot of variables, I'll, I'll click remove, is to select the terms and hit macros, and full factorial will add the main effects and all possible interactions. If you only want to add interactions up to a particular degree, in this case the default degree is 2, then we select the option factorial to degree. This is the same platform we'll use when we analyze design experiments. So we'll talk about a number of different options for fitting models from here. In this case, I'll simply select Run, and I will point out first that there are several different modeling personalities that are available from here. Since we've selected a, a continuous response, the default personality is standard least squares, or ordinary least squares regression. But there are a lot of other options available. Uh, I'm using Jump Pro, and so we'll see options like generalized regression and mixed model. Uh, stepwise is for model selection. Uh, generalized regression is for fitting non-normal responses and also uh, for penalized regression methods. And towards the bottom, we see some tools for looking at reliability and survival type of data. So we'll simply stick with standard least squares, and I'll select Run. And a new feature in Jump 12 is this effect summary table. And the effect summary table provides a high-level view of the significance of the terms in the model. And we're looking at the p-values. Um, the log worth is related to the p-value. The higher the log worth, the lower the p-value. And this gives us a nice way of reducing the model. And if we've got any problems with the model, if we put too many terms in the model that we can't estimate, uh, it allows us to clean this up a little bit before we continue with the modeling. So in this case, everything we have in the model is significant. Since polymer is categorical, we see a regression plot. So Jump is actually performing analysis of covariance. And we can see that the lines are not parallel. And this is an indication that the interaction term is significant. An interaction is a differential effect. And essentially what it's, what it's telling us is that the influence of polymer on the response, which is coal particles, depends upon the pH. And we can take the reverse of that. The influence of the pH on the coal particles depends upon the polymer. As we scroll down, we see an actual by predictor plot. This gives us an indication of the overall significance of the model. The blue line is the overall mean. The red line is the predicted mean. And what we're looking at is the actual value against what our model predicted we would get. And if the points are relatively close to this line, is an indication that we have very little unexplained noise or random variation. If we see a pattern to these points, this is a form of a residual plot, it's an indication that we've missed something. 
then we need another term in the, in the model, perhaps a quadratic term or perhaps we need a transformation. Again, we see the summary of fit table, the whole model test for significance. The parameter estimates are the terms in our model. And, and a couple of points here, JUMP uses a minus one plus one coding scheme for categorical variables. And if you'd like to apply a zero one coding scheme under the top red triangle, estimates is the option indicator parameterization estimates. If you'd like to see the model written out in long form, select the option show prediction expression. So this is the form of our model. We have an intercept and we have a slope for pH. Where we have a categorical variable, JUMP is providing a match statement, which is essentially saying if we have polymer A, add 52, if polymer B, subtract 12, and if polymer C, subtract 39. The second point I'd like to make about uh, this type of model, when we have an interaction, JUMP applies automatically centering of polynomials. This is an option in the FIT model platform. So you'll see an interaction term written out this way, where pH is listed at its mean. By default, we see effect test and a nice residual plot. And a couple of the options under the red triangle I'd like to point out, and we'll return to these when we get to design experiments, uh, one option is the profiler. There are a lot of nice graphical tools, and the profiler allows us to interact with the model that we've built. So if we look back at the parameter estimates, pH is highly significant, and it has a positive coefficient. So this indicates that as pH increases, so does the coal particles. The slopes of the lines we see correspond to the direction and strength of the coefficient. So notice that the slope for pH increases. So this indicates that as pH increases, so does coal particles. For polymer, which is categorical, we can select any one of these three levels. As I go from polymer A to polymer B, the downward slope indicates that the response will decrease. We have a significant interaction, and what that indicates is that as I change pH from the low level to the high level, the relationship between polymer and the response changes. So notice at the low level, B and C are relatively the same, and these bars represent confidence intervals. And as I drag it to the high level, A and B are very similar. So this is what we call the prediction profiler, and it's ideal for uh, exploring your model and also for making predictions. And under the red triangle, there are some additional options. Uh, this is a platform that allows you to do optimization. So if you, if you have several different responses, or if you're trying to match a target, uh, desirability can be used for this. And towards the bottom is an option, simulator. And what the simulator allows you to do is perform Monte Carlo simulations uh, based on values for the factors. And you can specify different distributions for those and also uh, different standard deviations. So from any model that we build, we can apply this desirability, which is our opt optimizer, or perform a Monte Carlo simulator. So this is fit model. Uh, and again, this is for fitting a linear model. Let's take a look at nonlinear modeling. And we'll just quickly introduce this. Under the Analyze menu, under Modeling, uh, there are a lot of options here. Partition is classification and regression trees. Uh, neural is for fitting a neural network. And again, I'm in Jump Pro, so I also have Model Comparison, which can be used for comparing different competing models. Uh, and we're going to take a look at the nonlinear platform. And I'll open up a data set, US population. There are several different models that are built in, and we can also ask Jump for help in identifying the best model. So I'll use nonlinear, and this again is data from the sample data directory called US population. Under the model library, if you know what the underlying model is, we can select that model from the model library. If I click on any one of these, Jump shows the form of that model. And then we can show the graph and then change the parameters and then make that formula. 
if you have a column that contains the formula, in this case we're looking at increases in U.S. population over time, then we can specify what that underlying formula is and click OK. And then we can use this to estimate the parameters for that model. So if I click Go here, then Jump is estimating the two parameters for the model that, that is specified. If we don't have an underlying model that we know, then I'll go back to this platform, nonlinear, and in this case I'll simply select the response, which is the population versus the year, and we'll use Jump to help us estimate the, the best fitting model. Under the red triangle for fit curve are a variety of different types of models, and for example, I'll, I'll start with fitting a logistic curve. The curve is fit, and under model comparison we see some high-level summary statistics for the model that we fit. And then additional statistics are available towards the bottom. So we see the parameter estimates for the model, under prediction model, the form of the model, and a definition of what those parameter estimates represent. And we can also ask for the prediction profiler, we can save the formulas out to the data table, and can, can perform inverse prediction. Let's fit a second model. So here I fit the logistic 3P, and let me fit, say, a quadratic. So both of these models have been fit, and the summary statistics are, are provided at the bottom. And under model comparison, what we see is a comparison of these two models. And it's comparing the models based on this AIC weight or corrected AIC, which is the Aikiki information criterion. What the weight is doing is it's estimating if I did indeed find the correct model, so I fit the quadratic and the logistic, what's the probability that out of these two models the quadratic is the correct model or logistic? And in this case it's indicating that the quadratic is the better model. So that's a quick introduction to nonlinear and let's talk a little bit about survival and reliability. And this is an area that we've done a lot of work over, over recent years. Uh, many options here for uh, fitting distributions, uh, for uh, degradation testing, reliability, and then some platforms that have been around for quite a while but are quite powerful in fitting models where we've got survival data or, um, or time to failure type of data. So as a quick introduction, I'm going to open up a data set and this is called comp time. And comp time, the response of interest is execute time, or time to execute a program. So think of this as we've got a, a, a computer program that's running, and we've got a number of users on the system uh, and a measure of the load on the system. I'll use life distribution. And this platform allows for uh, censoring, for failure causes, and also for a comparison between groups. In this case, we'll keep it simple. We've got time to execute as a response. And the default graph is the Kaplan-Meier non-parametric fit or curve. The scale allows us to explore different potential distributions. So think of this as a probability plot where if I apply a distribution and the points more or less follow a straight line, it's an indication that that distribution fits the data fairly well. And as I scroll through these, notice that for Shea, it seems to do a pretty good job. If I select that distribution, then it's fitting a curve with confidence bands, and notice that this seems to do a pretty good job. The distribution profiler is similar to what we've already seen in the prediction profiler, in this case, we're asking, what's the probability that the, the job is completed at a given execute time? So notice down towards the bottom level at 200, maybe this is 200 hours, the probability that it is completed is 0.77. If I'm out at 600, notice how it increases. So it's fitting that distribution and making predictions based on that fitted distribution. Under the red triangle at the top, there are several different options. In fact, for this case, I'll select Fit All Non-Negative, and I'll ask Jump to help me select the best distribution. 
and in this case it did indeed select Frechet's. On the model comparison, like we saw in the nonlinear platform, it's producing a number of different statistics, and in particular we see this BIC, which is the, uh, the Bayesian information criterion, and we can see that several of these distributions are actually fairly close together. So this is looking at one variable at a time. If we have more than one variable that we'd like to look at, then we can use life distribution, and then there are all sorts of specialized models that can be fit. So a quick sneak peek at reliability and survival. And let's move now into design experiments. The DUE menu is what we use to design experiments. And I will point out at the very bottom under sample size and power, uh, this is calculators for sample size and power for the, the common hypothesis test. So it's tucked away under the DOE menu. In terms of designs available, there are the classical textbook designs, a full factorial screening, which is the fractional designs, uh, and the Plackett-Berman response surface, a, a new design called definitive screening design, uh, so several different options available, uh, and a very flexible design platform called custom design. And what this allows you to do is design an experiment that meets your situation rather than picking a textbook design and customizing your, your experiment to the design that's available. Uh, any one of these platforms asks you to specify what the response is. So I'll add, uh, say I've got one response here. You can specify the goal. And let's say this is strength. I want to maximize the strength of uh, an aluminum coupon. You can specify the lower and upper limit if you have a target. If you have multiple responses that you'd like to optimize simultaneously, you can specify the importance uh, in the case where one might be more important than another. To add factors, we simply select factors, and I'll add a continuous factor. Let's say this is uh, time in an oven, and maybe this is, I'm just putting in numbers here, uh, 40 and 80. So 40 minutes and 80 minutes. I'll add a second continuous variable. Let's call this one the temperature. Oops. So this might be the oven temperature, 300 and 400. And I'll add a categorical variable. So I can add a discrete numeric or categorical or a variety of different types of uh, factors that can be added here. I'll select a three level categorical. Let's call this one oven type. So here I've got two levels of a continuous, two levels of the second continuous, and three levels of the categorical. If we consider some of these factors to be hard to change, we can change where it says easy, change that to hard or very hard. I'll click continue, and that'll, that'll by the way, produce um, split plot or whole plot or split, split plot types of designs. I'll click continue, and here we can specify constraints on the process and combinations that don't make sense or that, that are disallowed. And we can also specify the terms in our model. So we can tell jump which things we need to be able to estimate. So in this case, I'll select all three of these. And let's say we'd want uh, all two level interactions. So jump is indicating that we need a minimum of 10 runs to be able to estimate all of these terms. I'll add some center points. And I'll specify 12 runs and then click Make Design. So Jump will search for a solution, and under the red triangle, you'll see that there are different optimality criteria that are available. So here's the design, and anytime you design an experiment in Jump, you'll see under Design Evaluation that there are a number of options available for evaluating uh, this design and comparing it to other possible designs. And then when I click Make Table, Jump produces the design table in random order uh, if we want to go back to the design platform, we can select DOE Dialog. And then under Model is where we can simply hit Run Script and Jump will launch the FIT model platform populated with the terms that we've specified in the model. So that's how to design an experiment. Well, how would you analyze an experiment? The analysis is going to look identical to what we've already done when we've used the FIT model platform. So in this case, I've got a 2 to the 5th full factorial, and I'm looking at uh, yield, percent reacted, in a process where I've got five factors. 
Again, under macros, we can specify the terms to add to the model. I'll add up to three-way interactions. I'll go to macros, factorial to degree, and select run. Again, we see the effect summary table, actual by predicted, terms in the model, and the prediction profiler. And here we're looking at what the optimizer looks like. So if I'd like to optimize this process under the red triangle, I'll select maximize desirability, and jump will find the settings of my factors that maximize my response. And again, from here, I can also ask for a Monte Carlo simulator. So let's quickly talk about some of the, the quality tools that are available. Statistical process control is used when we want to be able to monitor a process over time. So when I introduced this diameter data at the very beginning, I ignored the fact that there was a time dimension to the data. To be able to plot this over time, under the Analyze menu, there's a platform specifically for quality and process tools. And the very, very first option is the Control Chart Builder. And this is built on the backbone of the Graph Builder. And what it allows us to do is drag and drop variables to produce a control chart. The red lines represent the limits that we would expect to observe in this process if the process were stable. And since I've got repeated measures within a day, we call this subgroup data. And the appropriate control chart in this case is either an X-bar R chart or an X-bar S chart. And here each point represents a mean of a certain number of observations. A very flexible platform for plotting uh, continuous response data or even attribute data that are collected over time if we'd like to understand how stable the process is over time. For understanding whether we're able to meet our customer expectations, we use the term process capability. And what a process capability study does is estimate the percent of time or the PPM rate uh, relative to a customer's specification limits. So here I can use the distribution platform, or I can use under analyze quality and process, I can use a control chart platform. And in this case, let's just assume that we have a batch of data. Under the red triangle, we'll see the option capability analysis. And when we enter specs for this process, I'll just enter some specs here. We have some different options we can set for a sigma. Then jump produces the capability output. If you've got multiple specs you'd like to simultaneously hit, or you've got multiple processes where you'd like to assess capability for all of these processes at one time, an quality process is the option process capability. And again, everything that we've covered here is a short guide or short video available under jump.com learn in the learning library.